I'm going to walk you through the steps and the theory for fine tuning a language model for memorization. This is where you have a custom data set and you want the language model to remember in detail, in great detail, ideally, the content of that custom data set when you use it later for inference. For agenda in this video, we'll start off by talking about the reversal curse. This will help you understand how language models work and why we have to fine tune as we do when we want them to memorize content. I'll then show a toy training example that will help understand the kind of data set you need in order to get effective memorization. Next, I'll show you the steps of building a synthetic question and answer data set. Usually you'll be starting with a PDF or a text document, but you'll need to get that data into the right format and also probably expand the data to make sure that you really get the model to memorize. I'll then talk through fairly briefly some of the hyperparameter choices in fine tuning a model, specifically choosing batch size, learning rate, number of epochs. I'll also talk briefly about which model you should start to fine tune. Then I'll walk you through all the steps on an A6000 GPU and run pod. I'll walk through the notebook, show you the results before finishing up and highlighting how the model performs before and after fine tuning and comparing it with some different hyperparameter and model choices. If you just start off with a document and you extract the text from it, you're probably going to have a hard time getting the model to memorize that content. Now, if you have very many documents considering the content from different angles, that will allow the model to build a statistical representation and probably you'll get reasonable memorization. So what I'm going to talk about now is how to generate a data set that will give the data from different perspectives. And those different perspectives allow the model to build a complete statistical representation of the knowledge and then give more accurate memorization. To help understand this a bit, we can look at what's called the reversal curse. Let me go over here to GPT. I'm asking a simple question. What is the name of Tom Cruise's mother? And the answer is Tom Cruise's mother was named Mary Lee Pfeffer South. She was a special education teacher and played a significant role in his early life before she passed away in 2017. Now look at this. If I flip that around and ask, what is the name of Mary Lee's son? And then I say, do not search the internet so that GPT doesn't check online. The answer is, the son is named Jonathan South. So why is it that GPT is able to tell me the mother of Tom Cruise, but not able to tell me Mary South's son? And the reason is because in the training data set, which is largely the World Wide Web, it's pretty much always Tom Cruise's name that appears with further information appended afterwards. For example, the name of his mother or parents or other things about Tom Cruise. But very rarely on the internet is it going to start some kind of fact or sentence with Mary South and then follow it up with Tom Cruise. And this helps you understand that if you just have one document which is actually a concise document, that's even worse, because each piece of information is only going to be presented maybe once and only once in one specific order. And that's not going to be enough to get robust representation. If you ask a question slightly differently in a different order, you're probably not going to get the same answer as what you expect when presented in the specific training data's order. So the whole key to getting good memorization is it's not enough to just take a sentence you need to have a copy of that sentence or the knowledge rather, and you need to represent it many times in different ways. Because then GPT has got a broader data set that gives a better statistical representation and is more likely to answer questions correctly when those questions come from different answers. To make this concrete, let's look at a toy training example. So you have a PDF and within the PDF, there's a sentence here. If the ball is propelled forward, the defending team is awarded a penalty. And what I'm saying is, that's not enough for getting accurate memorization. You need to have that sentence in different flavors. For example, defending team gets a penalty if the ball is propelled forward, or what's the result if the ball is passed forward, a penalty. And so to get good memorization, you need a way to have a starting data set and expand that into a much broader data set that ideally hits the questions from different angles. The next question is, given an input data set, so given this blue sentence, how can we systematically create an expanded data set? And the way I'm going to propose here is to do that synthetically using a language model. 
So here's how we might do that. We have the same phrase, which is going to be the raw text that goes to the language model. And I've added in here the content or context, which is international touch rugby rules. And now with this content and text, I'm going to ask the language model to create a nuanced question and answer. And I'm going to say the question much must include the context. So in this way, I'm able to send the raw data in to the language model and get back a question and an answer. Now that's just one question and answer, but you can think a bit further and by varying what exactly you're asking for, you can get different questions and answers. For example, you could have the language model create a simple question and answer rather than a nuanced one, or you could have the language model create a question and answer where the answer has got words that are reversed relative to how they appear in the original text. Now, by adding different requests to the language model, you can think for this same snippet of raw text, how different question and answer pairs can be created. Let's make the data expansion a little more concrete. So you start with a text document and it has about a million words or let's say a million tokens. You decide now what size chunks you're going to split it into. So you have these chunks of your original data set. And for each chunk, which maybe is 500 tokens, you'll ask a language model to create five questions. So you have five questions that will be generated to represent each chunk of raw input data. Now, as I mentioned, to get some variance in those questions and to hit the data set from different angles, you can make different requests. For example, ask for a nuanced question and answer or a simple question and answer. And to go one step further, you can run that same request to the language model at different temperatures. So for every chunk, you can get five questions at temperature zero, five questions at temperature 0.5, five questions at temperature one. And what that will do is add further spread to the range of questions you're getting and help to hit things from slightly different angles. So I'm going to go fully through a demonstration of data preparation and then a fine tuning. And I'm going to do it on the rules of touch rugby, which is a topic that's not particularly well understood by large language models because there's not a lot of data online about it. So I'll compare performance before fine tuning with performance after fine tuning on these expanded data sets. I'm going to create the data set synthetically. Um, there's a link here in the slides where you'll be able to see it on Hugging Face. I'm going to ask the language model to create one question per 60 tokens. So for my 500 token chunks, there'll be an expectation of five questions. And I'm going to generate five question and answer pairs nine times at temperatures that are evenly spaced from 0 0.01 all the way up to 1.2. So here I'm expanding my data set by a factor of nine by repeating the same request nine times at different temperatures, which will give me slightly different questions and answers. And the model I'm going to run on is OpenChat 3.5. It's a 7 billion model. And at the end, I'll show you how that performance compares to some other models, including Mixtral, Solar, and also the Quen 14B model. Now, before we move to the script, I want to cover a few hyperparameter choices. The first one here is around choosing the batch size. Here, I want to explain a rather subtle point. When you're training a language model, you can choose to just put in one row of data, but you can also, in parallel, put multiple rows through the GPU at the same time. This is efficient because GPUs are very good at parallel processing, and they can, in parallel, evaluate the forward pass on multiple rows of data, which allows you to speed up training. And when the GPU has parallel processed those rows, you will take the loss from each of the rows and those losses will get combined before doing a backward pass. But there's some nuance here in what the effect is of having just a backward pass through the result of one row and aggregating all of the forward passes to then backward pass the sum of those losses. Let me make that more concrete here. Let's start off with a case where you're doing batch size one. You're only putting one row of data in for forward pass and then backward pass to the language model. So you start off at some point and just imagine this point represents where the weights currently are in the model. So you start off with the model weights at point one and you do a forward pass through the first row of data. So you calculate the expected tokens 
and you compare those to what the actual next tokens were and you calculate a loss. Now, once you've calculated that loss, you back propagate that loss through the network in order to update your weights and you end up at point two. So going through one row of data results in updating the weights once according to the loss that was calculated using batch A of data or row A of data. Now you do the same thing again, but starting with the model weights at point two. So here, still with batch size one, we'll start with the weights with values at point two and we'll forward pass using batch two or row two of the data. And when we calculate the losses on batch two, we'll back propagate and that will update the weights and bring us to point three or rather three A, which I'm calling here. So you can see with batch size one, the model's weights are adapting to each row individually. So they're following each row in the training process and that's how the model weights are moving if you think of it as moving on a multi-dimensional surface. Now let's see how that's different when you increase the batch size. So with batch size of two, you in parallel calculate the forward pass for two rows of data and they're independently calculated. So the forward pass on batch A would result in moving your language model in this direction, whereas the forward pass on batch B, which is being done in parallel, would result in moving in this direction. Now, rather than first forward passing on A and then updating the weights and then doing pass B, instead what happens is you forward pass through A and B and you sum up the losses of both of those. And that's what this diagonal line is here. It's the effect of summing the losses from A and B. And so you sum up this loss and then you take a step in this direction here. And what this results in moving to the point, what I've called 3B here. And this point 3B is not the same as the point that you would get to if you individually moved row by row. So let me say that once more. If you're doing a batch size of one, you're moving the language model according to each row. So you're exploring the surface run row at a time and updating every time. But as you increase your batch size, you're combining the losses from the different batches and then taking a step. So in a sense, when you increase the batch size, you're kind of averaging across multiple rows. You're averaging those effects. And this is a good thing because the averaging means that it's less noisy. So you're gonna see less noise within your data. But the drawback is, as you increase the batch size, you're now not updating with the very specific information of each row. So if one row says something about the color red and the other one says something about a hippopotamus, you're moving according to the average update in a sense, rather than first taking the info of the red and then taking the info of the hippo. And this ends up being a bit nuanced because when you want to memorize, you might actually want to move very specifically according to the update of that specific row. And so it may be better to get clearer memorization if you just use a batch size of one and do a more granular update. Whereas if you're training on a very large amount of data, well then in order to avoid too much noise because you're jumping with every single row, you're gonna to start to put multiple batches together, both for speed and for stability. So if I sum all of that up, the benefits of a smaller batch size are more granular learning and fitting because you're doing this stepwise update. Also, you've less VRAM, so you need less space on your uh, GPU because you're only going to be using a smaller batch rather than multiple smaller batches. But the downside is your training is going to be slower and you're going to tend to have more overfitting because you're literally updating the model very specifically for each row that you have of data. Moving swiftly on, let's talk about learning rate. So here my guidance is to start at 1e minus 4 and you can generally increase that value so long as your training and your validation loss don't jump around too much. If you see that your training loss is jumping wildly or if your validation loss is jumping wildly, ideally your validation loss should be pretty smooth. That means you need to lower your learning rate. Conversely, if your training loss is extremely smooth, maybe you've got some room to increase your learning rate a little bit. Next up is choosing the number of epochs. 
Now, this tip that I'm going to give you is for a relatively short training run where you can afford to run that entire run multiple times and see what the optimal number of epochs is. I usually start off by running with a constant learning rate. So my learning rate is flat. And what happens if you do this and you do it over many epochs is that you will eventually find your validation loss starts to increase because your model starts to overfit. But I still like to go to that point and beyond because I can see the point at which my validation loss starts to increase and note how many epochs it took me to get there. For example, maybe my eval loss starts to go up after two epochs, so I'll note down two epochs. And then I'll rerun again, but this time I might change from a constant learning rate to cosine or linear. And what this does is it drops the learning rate so that as we approach the optimum, let's say we're approaching a local minimum, we will take smaller and smaller steps. And this can allow us to get a little bit closer and more granular on hitting exactly the bottom of that local convexity. Last up as an optimization, I want to emphasize the importance of choosing the right model for your application. This might sound obvious, but you should check what the performance is of a few different models on the application you're going for with no fine tuning. So before you even do anything for fine tuning, just raw with no data, not even any rag, try and see what the performance is on some sample questions. So I would ask questions on Touch Rugby, just of raw GPT-4, of raw Quen, of raw Mixtral, and see how that model performs. And of course, it's going to be logical to start off fine tuning in a lot of cases with the model that's performing best with no fine tuning at all. And note that that's not just about the model's strength, it's also about how much knowledge the model happens to have been trained on that overlaps with the knowledge you want to refine. So it may well be that a weaker model happened to be trained on touch rugby and so it's performing better on the questions and that might be an easier thing for me to train than to take the strongest model that knows absolutely nothing about touch rugby. Okay, we're ready now to move to the data preparation step. I'm going to be preparing my synthetic question and answer data set, and I'll be doing so with the help of the advanced fine tuning repository. You can purchase lifetime access to this on trellis.com. And also I'm making available for purchase just the scripts from the data set preparation and fine tuning video that I'm making today. So you can either buy only the scripts from today, or you can get lifetime access to this repo here, which includes scripts around DPO, Mamba, now memorization, chat fine tuning, embeddings, function calling, long context fine tuning, quantization, supervised and unsupervised fine tuning. So we'll be working out of the memorization branch here. I'll just open it up. This branch has a number of scripts that will allow you to prepare the data set, the synthetic data set that's expanded, and then it contains fine tuning scripts, which I'll also go through. There's the main memorization script, and I've also uploaded a copy that includes memorization if you want to be fine tuning a mixed trial model. As usual, you'll want to git clone the repository and you will want to start by creating a data folder with some kind of a PDF. Here is the PDF that I'll be working with. It contains the rules of touch rugby. Now, according to readme, the first step I want to do is convert that PDF from a PDF format into a raw text format. So what I'll do there after activating a uh, data env, which is the virtual environment and doing pip install requirements, I'm now going to run a uh, Python PDF to text.py. So here I've got Python PDF to text.py. And so yes, we've converted the train PDF to text. And so here we have the raw train.txt. And literally it's just the raw text pulled out of that PDF. Next up, we're going to convert that raw uh, text into chunks. And with those chunks, we're going to ask questions. And the questions that are generated, we'll want to then put into a training file here. So my goal now is to basically create this file. So this is a very large file of questions and answers. You can see that every second line is a question and then an answer. And what I'm doing is chunking the raw text and asking the language model to return uh, questions to me. So we'll take a quick look at how that's going to work. 
And to do so, I'm going to look at create QA.py. And within this, what I want to uh, show you is an example of what the prompt looks like. Okay, so down here in the script, I have a little snippet, which is my prompt. So I'm going to just copy that snippet and, and put it over here so we can read it together. So here's, here's the prompt that I'm using. And it goes as follows. Provide questions per chunk train. So this would be, I believe, five question and answer pairs based on the text above. So I'll have injected the text above. The question should include sufficient information for the answer without the user having any further context. So what you don't want is a question that just says, what is the rule about the five meter line? That's a bad question because there's no context for whether that relates to touch rugby or some other sport. So you need the language model to make sure the questions have got the context within them. The answers need not necessarily borrow verbatim from the input text, but they should maintain the meaning. Vary the style and format of the questions, include some tricky and nuanced questions. In certain answers, reverse the order of words compared to how they appear in the text input. Respond in plain text on a new line for each question and answer. Do not include question numbers. And then here's an example of a question answer pair. Now this is valuable as always. I'm doing a one shot prompting because now I'm putting in uh, an example of the format of how I want the question and answer to be returned back to me. And so the idea now is to run that on um, my input raw data. And I'll just show you a wrapper script on this create question and answer script. The wrapper script here allows me to repeat this script at different temperatures. So you can see it's uh, going to rerun the script at different temperatures between 0 0.01 and 1.2. So I'm going to run this here uh, by typing Python and create dense qa.py. And now it's asking me to enter one sentence to provide the context of the data set you're training on. And this is going to get injected in at the start of every snippet of text so that the language model knows the context. And for context, I'm just going to put international touch rugby rules. Next, I'm being asked the number of times to iterate over QA generation. So this is the number of different temperatures I want to run at, evenly spaced between 0 and 1.2. If you go much higher than 1.2, the answers will be so chaotic, you'll just see instability in the responses that you get, and you'll get bad synthetic data. I'm just going to go for one here, which will put, I believe, the temperature right in the middle of the uh, 0 and 1.2. But if you do 9, it would be much better, and you'll see later that more data is needed for getting good memorization. So I've just put in one. And now it'll ask to process one chunk or all chunks. The reason for this is you just want to test quickly and cheaply on the first chunk, see if it's working, and then you can run the full data set. So here I'm just going to type one because I don't want to waste too much time on the video. And the last question is to run with OpenAI or RunPod. You can set up a RunPod endpoint. Check out the one-click LLMs repo for one-click templates. I will say you need a strong enough model, probably Mixtral at least, maybe Llama 70B. But here, I'm going to use OpenAI, and we can see, um, because I've selected one prompt, it's going to actually print everything out, which is nice, because we'll be able to talk through what it's saying. But right up here, it's also telling me, um, setting eight questions per 500 token chunk. So that's the number of questions per chunk. Um, the total tokens in all chunks, although we're only processing one, is 10,000. So there's about, this is a text of 10,000 tokens. And here's the cost if I use GPT-4, it's 84 cents. And with GPT-3.5 Turbo, it's about 2 cents. And here's what the prompt looks like. So we have input text. And note how I wrap it in this input text. This really helps the model to understand very specifically what input text refers to. Context is international touch rugby rules. Then I literally just have that 512 token chunk of text wrapped within input text as well. And now the prompt, provide eight question and answer pairs based on the text above, etc. as we already went through. Here's an example of a question and answer pair. And actually, I give two pairs here. So you can see there are two pairs of questions and answers with the right formatting. Again, wrapped in example to help improve um, the, the language model's knowledge of what I'm referring to. And so that script um, has been run. We've just run with one temperature, which is close to zero. And so I can check out now both train.txt and test.txt. So in train.txt, I have a series of eight questions. 
and answers, which you can see here. What edition of Touch Football Rules was presented by Touch Football Australia, etc. And you can see it's well formatted. And you can also see that we have a test data set. So I think the ratio is roughly 10 to 1. So there'll be one piece of data very roughly in the test data set, which we'll use for validation for every 10 that are in the training data set. Now, the next step, given all of these questions and answers, and you'll have run it, uh, say, nine times different temperatures in full for the full data set, the next step is to get it into CSV format. Now, I want to actually get it in a very specific format, which is a conversational format. I want to have an array of messages, and I want the questions to be set as the user, and then I want the assistant to be the content for the answer. Now, furthermore, you can see the questions are actually quite short. I mean, relative to the context length of the language model, this is probably only 100 tokens. So what we can do is we can combine five questions just in series within the same prompt uh, within the conversation. So you'll see here in a conversation, we have the user, we have the assistant. But after this assistant here, you'll see we again will have the user because I'm putting in five question and answer pairs within the same prompt here. And this will just speed up training because we can uh, have a longer context length within each row of data. So in order to get from the train.txt set of questions into the CSV format, I'm just going to run a piece of code here, which is uh, Python QA to CSV. And that should be pretty quick to run. And next up, once it's in CSV, I've just recreated there. You'll see, for example, because we only created one test data point, there is going to be uh, just one row of data here. And actually, it's only going to have one user and one assistant because our test set only has one, whereas the train set here, it's going to have two rows of data because we've eight, uh, eight original questions and answers. So there's five in the first one and the second one shorter because there's only three in that. Uh, as you can see here, the second one is shorter. And the last step is once we have that in question and answer format, we're going to push it to Hugging Face. So it'll be Python push, push to hf.py. And here I'm going to put in an authentication token from Hugging Face. And then I'm going to put in the repo name. And that will then push the data up uh, to the cloud to the Hugging Face hub. And here we are on Hugging Face on Trellis repository for touch rugby rules memorization. And you can see we have a training split and a test split. Um, about five to one in ratio here, actually. And in the training split, you can see there are 303 rows. Uh, here's a sample row here, all set up in messages. And the beauty of having them set up in messages is that we'll be able to just use the tokenizer.applychat template function, and that will format our prompt exactly as it needs to go into training and inference. Um, so very nice if you can format your data in the form of messages with alternating users and assistants. Just makes the training script we'll see later a lot easier. Okay, with that, we're ready now to move to the fine tuning itself. Okay, to get started with fine tuning, I'm going to open up a one-click template on RunPod. And this will allow me to start off a CUDA 12.1 instance. I'm going to start up an A6000 uh, let me select one here, 48 gigabytes of VRAM. So this is sufficient to fully fine tune something like OpenChat or Mistral. If you want to fine tune Mistral, you'd have to use quantization, which is possible. And there's a script in advanced fine tuning repo for that. Of course, you could use larger or more parallel GPUs too, if you want to fine tune larger models. Now, everything should be set up here fine. This is enough space, 50 gigabytes. Um, it's about 15 gigabytes for open chat for the model itself. And you want to have enough space to save another copy for the fine tuned one. So 50 is plenty, 215s is 30. So plenty of headroom there. And we'll continue and we'll deploy that run pod and open up Jupyter Notebook. Now, here I am in Jupyter Lab and I've got the notebook open here for memorization via chat fine tuning. So first off, if you're going to run this in Google Collab, and you're going to use the free GPU, that's a T4, then um, you're not going to be used flash attention. So you'll have to comment it out when we load the model below. Furthermore, anywhere you see BF16, which is brain float 16, you'll need to replace that with floating point 16, FP16, because that's only supported by the newer GPUs. And that's why I've run on an A6000, because it does have the Ampere architecture, and that allows us to run 
the latest version with flash attention. Now, the first thing to do is the installation. So typically I will run this script here. All of the versions have been frozen. So any breaking changes as these packages are updated should not create any issues. Once I run this installation, what I like to do is then restart the kernel. So I'll do kernel and shut down all kernels. And then I'll pick up and start running the cells from right below here. Now within this script, it's possible to run with unsloth to accelerate fine tuning by about 2x. That will work with Llama or Mistral style models. OpenChat is a Mistral base model, and so it will work with that. If you're using other model architectures like say DeepSeek, then you should probably just stick with the baseline fine tuning approach, which is what I'm gonna show here. So I'll typically log into Hugging Face just so I can push my fine tune model at the end. Then I'll enable this in our environment variable. This allows me to do high speed downloading and uploading from and to Hugging Face Hub. Next up, I'm gonna set the model, which is OpenChat. So OpenChat 3.5 and move on to loading. Now here, when I'm loading the model, you can see I have the quantization configuration commented out because I'm going to fine tune here in 16 bit precision. I've also set the torch data type to be float 16 because that gives better quality than using float 16, which is uh, what you would have to do if you're using an older GPU like in collab with the T4. You'll also see flash attention is enabled because I'm using the latest GPU. The tokenizer is then being loaded here. And next up, I like to run a quick check that all of my parameters are on the GPU and not on meta, which is the CPU, because I want to train only on the GPU. Next up, we're going to set up LoRa for doing the fine tuning. We're not going to fine tune all the parameters. We're just going to fine tune some adapters, some smaller adapters that are created. They will be trained while we'll freeze the base model. And at the end, we'll remerge um, the product of those lower matrices back onto the original model to create our fine tuned model. So here I'm just setting up a function so I can see the trainable parameters. Often I'll recommend actually running this cell to print the model. It will show you a list of modules and that allows you to pick which modules you want to fine tune. Now, as typical, we'll fine tune the attention modules and we'll also fine tune the linear layers. Note that if you're fine tuning Mixtral, you have to comment this out because the linear layers are sparse and it becomes messy if you try to fine tune them. Just one other note, if you're gonna use a quantized model, you do need to prepare the model for k-bit training. So you need to run this load of coding here. Just above it, you can see gradient checkpointing. You can enable this here to reduce the VRAM during the training. It will keep checkpoints, which I think adds a little bit of computation, but saves you on VRAM. Here, we're applying the LoRa. So we're creating those small trainable matrices um, to the side of our main model. And we're ready to move on and set up the tokenizer. I like to print the tokenizer to inspect it and see the vocab size, check the beginning and end of sequence tokens. And in this case here, um, what I like to do is apply the chat template. So just see what chat template is set up in the tokenizer, make sure there is one there. And this is the format that um, GPT or rather OpenChat uses. So I can see this is how my prompts will be prepared for training and for inference. Now I like to set the pad token. My preference is to set it as pad or pad like this, if it's already in the tokenizer. But since it's not in this case, I'm setting it to unk. So you can see down here, we're using the unknown token for the padding. And here I just print out a summary of the beginning um, of the pad token router. And I can see the number of tokens in the tokenizer, which is unchanged because I haven't added any extra pad tokens. The next step here usually would be to set the embedding and norm layers as trainable. This is really only needed if you're changing the chat template or if you're going to extend the context length so I didn't run these cells. I don't think it's necessary. We can just train with LoRa. Now we're gonna set up evaluation. This part requires a little bit of human ingenuity and that is around setting up questions. So it's really important that you have some questions that you're confident indicate the quality of the fine tuning. I've just set up some manual questions about touch rugby here and provided some answers. You can use these questions and answers to evaluate raw models with no fine tuning and that will tell you whether they have any insight on touch rugby already. But then you're going to use these after the fine tuning to determine if it has been effective. So before doing the fine tuning, we will run through all of these questions just to see the performance. I won't go through all 11 of them, but you can see, for example, that OpenChat does not know a lot about touch rugby. How many players are on the field in each team? It says there are 12 and the answer is six. 
So actually, open chat on this, I believe, gets about one out of 11 questions correct. So it does not know a whole lot about touch rugby, um, but it's a model that actually ends up being tunable very well. And we'll see that in the results later on. Next up, we're going to load the data set. It's that data set I showed on Hugging Face. We can print out a few samples of the data set, um, if you wish. But really, there's very little handling we have to do with the data set because it's already in this messages format. So we have it set up as an array of messages, and that is going to allow us to very easily format the text just using the SFT trainer. All we have to do is pass the data into the SFT trainer. We don't need to do any other formatting, and that really makes things very easy. So let's just get to the trainer setup here. Um, I'm going to train for one epoch. I did play around with this for two, but one is about what I needed to get the best results. The context length is 512. So I have checked that when I have five Q&As, they're never longer than 512. I'm going to use um, gradient accumulation and batch size of one. So batch size, as we discussed earlier, if I use one, it's going to give some very granular updates and hopefully help with memorization. Gradient accumulation is a way to virtually increase the batch size. What it means is that even if the GPU can't fit parallel batches, we're going to take uh, one batch, take the loss, and then instead of back propagating, we'll run another batch. And then we'll add together those losses and back propagate. So typically, increasing gradient accumulation has pretty much got the same effect on quality, whether good or bad, as increasing the batch size. But changing the gradient accumulation does not change the amount of VRAM that you need, but it does change the amount of training time because if you are going to basically accumulate batches, it means you need to do backward passes less frequently, and that's going to save you a little bit of time during the training. In any case, I want the most granularity, so I've set both of these to one. Now, I've got a custom callback here, which is just helping me to do a little bit of logging. There's nothing major happening there. And we're right on now to the trainer itself. And you can see I'm passing in the data set and the key field is messages uh, field that you can see here. And those messages will then have the tokenizers chat template applied to them automatically. I'm going to run here for one epoch. Um, I have that set uh, earlier as a value of one. And there's not a whole lot here else to show you. Oh, yes, I did initially run with um, a constant learning rate scheduler, so the same learning rate. And I figured out that one epoch was actually about the right amount to get the validation loss to start rising. So then I reran it using cosine, and that brought me down to a very nice uh, training curve that asymptotes down towards a low value for the validation loss. As you can see, my learning rate is 1e-4. I didn't end up needing to improve that much at all. Now down here, there's a parameter to add noise during fine tuning. In certain fine tunings, this can improve performance and reduce overfitting. I'll talk about it in the ablations towards the end of the video. Um, long story short, I didn't find that it really improved or disimproved the training performance. Now with the training running, um, I had the validation loss falling and the training loss falling, so everything looked good. It's easier actually if we visualize that in the form of a graph, which we can do here. You can see my training loss is falling fairly smoothly and as is the evaluation loss. So once trained, we can look at the evaluation after training. And I'll, let's just look at that same question. So how many players on the field each time, uh, on, uh, how many players on the field in touch rugby? And the answer is each, player, each team has six. So it's getting uh, the answers correct. Um, let's check another one here. How many substitutions are allowed? And the answer is there's no limit to the amount of substitutions allowed during a game. And actually, of these 11 questions, um, the model gets 8 out of 11 correct, which is a very big increase uh, from 1 out of 11. Now, let's maybe look at one question that gets wrong. So here, in touch rugby, does a forward pass result in a roll ball, a scrum, or something else? And it says a forward pass results in a roll ball, which is incorrect. It's actually a penalty. Now, just to highlight why this question is so difficult, if we go back and we go to the raw training data here, which is just the data extracted, if I search for forward pass, there's actually no forward pass uh, combination of words. So the word forward pass is commonly known by people who play rugby or touch rugby, but it's actually not strictly in the raw data. And because it's not there, it's also not in the synthetic data set. And this makes it pretty hard for the model to appreciate. 
Um, there's actually a related question, I think, down here, which is um, what happens if the player makes a touch and makes a pass after a touch has been made? Sorry, not necessarily related, but it's a tricky question. Um, it basically relates to uh, a question where we call touch pass. So if you pass it after being touched, you basically uh, lose a quarter and it's a penalty to the other team. But here it says uh, the pass is considered dead and the touch counts. And again, this is just difficult because it's not described in the same terms um, as is described within the original rules data set. So that is a summary of looking at this open chat model. We've brought the performance from 1 out of 11 up as far as uh, 8 out of 11. So let's now look at some ablations. So that means looking at different changes to the hyperparameters and models and see how that affected performance. Just to ground ourselves with different changes to the training setup, let's recap on the training I just showed you. This was using synthetic data with one question per 60 tokens, and I expanded the data set by running the same request to the language model at nine different temperatures. So we expanded uh, the data set. It's not actually one question per 60, it's really nine questions per 60 because of that expansion there. And the base run that I did was on OpenChat 3.5. So given that, with OpenChat scoring 8 out of 11, what are some changes and what kind of effects on performance did I see? Well, the first ablation I did was just running with a 1x expansion. In other words, I only created the data set at low temperature. I did it with temperature close to zero. And in that case, I only got 4 out of 11 instead of 8 out of 11. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, by creating data sets at different temperatures, I obviously had way more data and I would have more data coming from different directions. And so I think the quantity of data is quite important here and more data, especially if it's good data, can help the performance. The next ablation I did is instead of running with a batch size of one and gradient accumulation of one, I ran with a batch of four and gradient accumulation of eight. Now that's a very big increase. It's an increase to a virtual batch size of 32. So that means I'm averaging the losses from 32 uh, rows of training and then back propagating on that basis. And indeed, while it reduces overfitting, it has very strongly affected the performance here of memorization. And it does seem like those smaller granular updates give better results. Now, maybe using a batch of two and a smaller gradient accumulation would have done just as well or similarly. But what this shows is that if in this case, you use a very large virtual batch size, it really affects the performance. Last off, as I mentioned, I tried adding a little bit of noise to the embeddings and I got the same performance there. So I don't see a big effect or benefit in that case. The other ablations I looked at were to consider different models. So here, instead of starting with open chat, which actually had two out of 11, I think I incorrectly said one. So fine tuning moved it from two up to eight. I took a look at the Mixtral model. Now, Mixtral started off from a stronger base point. It was getting four questions correct out of 11 with no fine tuning and no context provided to it. After fine tuning, it got brought up to nine. So you can see that using a bit of a stronger model in this case, and when I say stronger, I mean not just stronger in terms of parameters, but also stronger in terms, it seems, of the data set it was trained on, at least from a touch rugby standpoint. I also ran Quen, which was very weak. Um, it did not get any questions correct when I used the unfine-tuned model, and it only got up as far as three when I fine-tuned it. And last, Solar 10.7b, which is actually a Llama model with some extra layers in it. Um, those layers are copy-pasted actually from Mistral. So it's a Llama architecture, but using the weights from Mistral and then combining basically the bottom two thirds of a Mistral model with the top two thirds of a Mistral model. So the middle layers are kind of copied and then doing further fine tuning. Very interesting model that performs well for its size. In any case, Solar 10.7b did not perform very well as a baseline without fine tuning. And it did improve significantly with the fine tuning up to a score of six out of 11. Now, as a final point, I want to show you some benchmarking just to compare how OpenChat does relative to GPT 3.5 and 4. I did not fine tune GPT 3.5, and I don't think it's possible right now to fine tune GPT 4. But what I did was compare the answers of the GPTs with no data whatsoever. So just asking the questions. And indeed you can see both 
of the open AI models know something about touch rugby. Uh, GPT 3.5 scored 6 out of 11 with no fine tuning. GPT 4 scored 7 out of 11. And then when I just put in the 10,000 tokens of context, which is the rule book, so not the synthetic data, but the rule book, I was able to get uh, 10 out of 11 correct with GPT 3.5 and get all 11 out of 11 correct with GPT 4. The one question GPT 3.5 got wrong is a question where I asked, how far back do the defenders need to stand after a penalty? And is that number of meters different than after a touch? And the correct answer is for a penalty, it's 10 meters. And after a touch, it's seven. GPT-4 gets that correct. But GPT-3.5, even when given the correct context, like the full rule book within the context, it still thinks that it's seven meters you have to back up in both cases, which is incorrect. But broadly speaking here, I think it's clear that these models from OpenAI, they just know more about touch rugby. And so even if you are to fine tune them, you would expect they would probably do better just on the basis that they're starting from a very strong starting point. And that wraps up this video on fine tuning for memorization. Remember, check how a few different models perform for the task you're interested in before doing any fine tuning and see if you can get a head start by using a model that knows a little about your domain. Second of all, make sure your data set is covering the questions and answers you need, the knowledge you need from different standpoints. Maybe you have some very rich raw documents that are just complementary and give you different perspectives, but often you just have one rule book that actually is written in a very concise way and doesn't repeat the information, especially doesn't repeat it from different perspectives. In that case, you probably want to generate some Q&A and do it in a way that gives you the different vantage points. As usual, let me know any questions below in the comments. Cheers, folks.